Hi, this is the voice, Michael Shavello. You're listening to the Premium Odds Cast, hosted by leading MMA odds maker Nick Kalikas, fight scientist and author of Fightnomics, Reed Kuhn, and MMA journalist Brian Heminger. The absolute best UFC betting info, picks, statistics, and analysis from the most respected authority in mixed martial arts betting, MMAOddsBreaker.com. Welcome to the Premium Odds Cast, presented by Five Dimes Sportsbook. I'm Brian Hamminger, joined today by leading mixed martial arts odds maker Nick Kalikas to break down this Saturday's UFC Fight Night 100 event, which takes place in Sao Paulo, Brazil. If you're unfamiliar with our format, myself and Nick will break down the fight card from top to bottom, providing extensive analysis and a pick for each fight after doing our film study for the event. Uh, now, we broke down how the fight played out for UFC 205 in our previous podcast, which was posted yesterday, so check that one out if you want a recap. Now back to the present, UFC Fight Night 100 features a 12-fight card in total and will be aired on UFC Fight Pass and Fox Sports 1 this Saturday night. Let's dive right in. Now kicking off the preliminary card on Fight Pass is a light heavyweight contest between Fransomar Barroso, who is 18-5, and and UFC newcomer Darren Stewart, who is 7-0. Now Nick, where did you open this fight and how has the public shifted things so far? Up in Barroso, minus 160, the comeback on Stewart at plus 120. Looking over at our sponsored sportsbook, 5dimes.eu, it is currently Barroso, minus 150, the comeback on Stewart is plus 130. So line margins basically tighten up a little bit, not a lot of action coming in on this fight either way. I understand it a little bit. I mean, Barroso is not the most popular fighter for the betting windows in most sports books, and Stewart is making his UFC debut. So he's one of these guys that's kind of a prospect, obviously, uh, coming in from overseas. And you know what? He's definitely an intriguing prospect because he's an undefeated light heavyweight, primarily a striking-based fighter. Um, he definitely has some good boxing. He's light on his feet, power in both hands. So there is something to like about him. I mean, he goes out there and he finishes fights in the most for the most part. Um, I also like the fact that he utilizes his elbows well, especially when he's inside close range. So he does definitely have a decent clinch game. And on top of it, he also mixes in some takedowns. So what you see from Stewart is actually a pretty complete game. I just not so sure that he's at the level Barrasso is, especially at the, as far as competition level. I mean, this is going to be the, the hardest fight of his life facing a guy like Barrasso and, and, and by far the best fighter he's ever faced. So there's some question marks there. Um, but he does have all the tools and the skill set to definitely make an impact in the UFC light heavyweight division. Um, or even possibly after this fight dropping down to uh, middleweight. I don't know if that's an option for him, but I think that size wise, a middleweight might actually fit Stewart better, but we'll, I'm not sure how harsh the weight cut is for him. But Barrasso looking at him. I mean, he's a pretty seasoned vet. Like I said, he's just a tough out. I mean, obviously, Krylov was able to dispose of him in his last fight. He choked him out. But before that, he has a win over uh, Mutopsic, you know, in his debut. Again, a guy fighting out of his weight class a little bit in that spot as well. And But what impressed me the most was his win over the late Ryan Jimmo. I mean, Jimmo is not an easy out. And I think Barrasso, that was one of his best performances to date. So that's the kind of fighter you're going to get with Barrasso. I mean, he has that experience. He's a tough out in every aspect of the game. I mean, he has some striking. He's got a little bit of power to go along with it. So he's dangerous on the feet. He likes to pin people up against the cage and kind of slow the pace down it's from time to time. He also does have takedowns in wrestling and he's got some submission skills. So Barrasso is a very complete fighter. He's just at this point, he's 36 years old. He's not going to overwhelm anybody with his abilities, but he's just going to be a stubborn, tough out. So for me, I have to lean a little bit more towards Brasso until Stewart shows us that he's capable of beating a guy like Brasso. I'm, I'm not going to buy into it quite yet. But again, he has all the tools to definitely make an impact in the UFC. I just think he has to kind of pass this test first for me to believe in him. So I'm going to pick Brasso. It should be a tough fight. I think if Brasso loses this fight, is it, it is because he gets knocked out. But if he doesn't get knocked out, I think he wins on the scorecards or maybe even finishes Stewart late. So my pick is Brasso. This fight is definitely tricky. I mean, Darren Stewart is a really talented striker, a lot of power, nicknamed the dentist because of all the knockouts he was given out. And not only was he 7-0 and as a professional in England, he was 4-0 and as an amateur too. So, I mean, this guy is serious business, even though he hasn't faced a lot of tough opposition. I mean, Francis Barroso is definitely going to be his stiffest test to date, and not only is it going to be his toughest opponent, but he's going to have to cross the pond and go all the way to Brazil to do it in his UFC debut. So, I mean, a lot of the smaller factors are definitely against Stewart here. That being said, 
Barroso has not really been that impressive. Even in his best wins, like the, the Jimmo fight that Nick brought up, I mean, that fight was so boring. Neither guy really did anything. And Jimmo just sat there and, and did nothing. So, I mean, if, if that's what happens here, if, if Barroso gets into a staring contest and just is slightly more active, I think Stewart can just outwork him. Uh, Stewart's conditioning is something that's potentially going to be an issue because he does have a lot of quick knockouts and then UFC debut if he has a, a big adrenaline dump. We've seen it time and time again where maybe fighters don't historically have bad conditioning, but they do in their UFC debut because they're just so amped up. So uh, definitely pay attention to how Stewart looks and performs in that first round. Uh, but in that first round, even though Stewart is a little bit undersized at light heavyweight, I expect him to be the better striker, the more powerful striker, the more active striker. I definitely can see him winning the first round. It's just all about whether or not he can knock out Barroso in the first round and also whether or not, um, even if he goes out and wins the first round, does he have the conditioning to win another round? And does he have the conditioning to hold on and maybe win a decision? So I'm tentatively picking Darren Stewart, but... Uh, definitely a lot of the intangibles are in Barroso's favor. So just be cautious out there. Now dropping down to the Bantamweight division for the Fight Pass headliner, we have Pedro Munoz, who is 12 and 12-2 with one no contest, taking on Justin Scoggins, who is 11-2. and 2. Now, Nick, what's the MMA oddsmaker's perspective on this one? I up in Scoggins, minus 190, the comeback on Munoz at plus 150. Again, looking over to five dimes, it's currently Scoggins, minus 170. The comeback is still at plus 150. So line margins have tightened up a little bit. There has been two-way action reported on this fight. A lot of split opinions because you do have two of the best bantamweights in the world going at it. I know Scoggins just coming up to bantamweight. I mean, he was fighting, obviously, at uh, flyaway for a while. And he just, unfortunately for him, he, he just couldn't make that weight cut anymore. So... He's back at Bantamweight right now, and I think Bantamweight's probably going to suit him a lot better. I mean, he's going to be a little bit more comfortable, and I think he can still perform relatively well in this division. In fact, if he gets a win over Munoz, then he's really on his way to getting in the mix for uh, the title 135. I know it's a pretty crowded division. Obviously, he's got a long way to go, but still, I mean, this is a good start for him. So Scoggins, even though he's, again, up at Bantamweight for this bout, I think he's going to be just fine. In fact, he's going to be a little bit taller than Munoz, and he's going to have a two-inch reach advantage. So I don't think he's going to be really outsized. But this this fight is awesome because you got two, again, talented band weights going at it. Munoz, in my opinion, is, is so fun to watch every time he fights because the guy is such a complete fighter. He's a finisher. I mean, he could obviously win on the scorecards as well, but Munoz, his sub game is ridiculous. I mean, he's got a sick, sick guillotine choke on the feet. He's not bad. He's got a little bit of knockout power to go along with it, and he's got some technical skills. So he gets in wars. I mean, his last fight with Rivera, unfortunately for him, it was a split decision um, type of loss, but at the same time, I shouldn't say it was the last fight. I'm sorry, two fights ago because he fought Dylan in the last fight. But that fight that he had with Rivera was a split decision war. And that's the kind of fight you can expect from Munoz. And again, he, he answers that and gets back on track with, again, a win over Dylan, So, which isn't an easy out. So Munoz is definitely a tough out because he's so well-rounded. He has the ability to finish, and he's dangerous, especially with that guillotine choke. Now, Scoggins, if you all recall... He did lose to Moraga by guillotine choke. He was looking good in that fight, but I mean, while it lasted, but he got caught in that choke, and Munoz can definitely repeat that performance. Now, since then, Scoggins has faced grapplers such as Ray Borg, uh, which is one of the best grapplers, I think, obviously, in the flyweight division, and, and Scoggins was able to survive, take him down, and kind of play around with him on the ground, and he did not get subbed. So Scoggins, his, his submission defense has improved, and I think it was a wake-up call in the Moraga fight. So outside of that, I think Munoz is going to be in a lot of trouble here because Scoggins is definitely the better fighter overall on the feet. Again, he's going to be a little bit longer. He's just so unorthodox with that karate style, and he's so precise and and has some power in his hands or his feet that it's going to be a tough matchup on the feet for Munoz. So he's going to have to get this fight to the ground, and I believe Scoggins gets sprawl brawl well. And in fact, he might be the better wrestler of the two, so he might even get top position if this does go to the ground. Again, as long as he doesn't stick his neck in anything, I think he's probably going to come up with a win, either by stoppage or or on the scorecards. So for me, it should be a fun fight, contested back and forth. I mean, we should see a true battle from two high-level competitors, but I, I do side with Scott because I think he is the better fighter of the two, so I'm going to pick him. Now, obviously, Pedro Munoz has had some success in the Bantamweight division, but 
Justin Scoggins was really on the rise in the flyweight division before basically getting kicked out of the division because he was having such uh, an issue making weight. And it's pretty apparent why he was having so much trouble making weight for the flyweight division. He's still bigger than Pedro Munoz, even though he's moving up a weight class. He's got a two inches longer reach. He's an inch taller. He's his leg reach is three inches longer. So uh Scoggins probably belongs in the Bantamweight division. And at flyweight, I mean, he was just bullying some people. Um, now, overall, I would say Scoggins has the better pure striking compared to Munoz. Uh, he show, he really finally started to showcase it in that last fight against Ray Borg, where he was just clearly the better stand-up artist against Borg. And then he mixed in some wrestling along the way as the fight moved on and he had, uh, gained a little bit more confidence. Now, he is going to have to be careful. If he just wants to stand and trade with Munoz, he'll, he should have the edge. Even though Munoz is a pretty good striker, Munoz is a little wild for my taste. And I think Scoggin should see a lot of that stuff coming and should be able to handle whatever Munoz brings on the feet. Where Munoz is particularly dangerous is on the ground. He has an elite ground game, great submissions. So if Scoggins wants to mix in wrestling like he did in the Borg fight, he has to be very cautious because Munoz could definitely wrap something up and maybe choke him out like John Moraga did at flyweight. So as long as Scoggins isn't, you know, over aggressive and leaves something exposed, then he should win this fight. So even though Pedro Munoz is exceptionally talented and, you know, came into the UFC as the RFA champ and has racked up a couple quality wins, I think this is definitely a Justin Scoggins fight to lose. As long as he comes in and the weight cut uh, works great for him and, and he's able to push a high pace and he doesn't leave his neck exposed, Justin Scoggins should win this fight. So I'm going to pick him. Now, moving up to the heavyweight division, we have Luis Henrique, who is 9-2 and two with one no contest, taking on Christian Colombo, who is 8-1-1. One, and one. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened Henrique minus 270, the comeback on Colombo at plus 190. Right now, looking over five dimes, it's minus 240 for Henrique. The comeback on Colombo is plus 200, so line margins have tightened up a little bit. And this is definitely an interesting fight. Colombo, I think, performed relatively well, well against Dan Ho, making his UFC debut. There was a lot of question marks coming into that fight. He had some time off, and Dan Ho is... Definitely the type of fighter that can be some problems for, for most people. But Colombo's experiences in the Euro scene obviously paid off a little bit. Um, and again, with his size alone and his skill set, he's definitely a tough out for a lot of fighters. So it, that was a solid win. Even though he squeaked by in that fight, it was a, it definitely a solid win to get him uh, his first successful UFC debut win. And obviously he's coming back for round two here against Enrique. Now this is a tougher matchup though for Colombo, for sure. I mean, again, Colombo is going to have the size advantage overall and that can be difficult to deal with, but skill set for skill set. I do believe that Henrique has the ability to beat Colombo anywhere the fight takes place. I mean, I think on the feet, Henrique is faster. He's got uh, better striking overall. He's got more knockout, pure knockout power. And I think on the ground, Henrique has better wrestling. He's able to get top position. Um, he can obviously finish the fight on the ground in most cases as well. So he might be able to do that to Colombo as well. And then if he hits the scorecards, which has a possibility. I mean, both these guys, unlike most heavyweights that seem to fade pretty fast as the fight goes, these guys are the type of fighters I think they can go three rounds. And even though they might be a little bit slower in round three, I mean, it's not really a question mark as far as gas tanks go. I think these guys are tough enough to survive each other a little bit. So we probably do see it go over that one and a half round mark that's currently out there. But but as far as matchup goes, I don't know. I just favor Henrique pretty much across the board here. Again, I'm not disrespecting Colombo because I think he is a tough out with his size and his skill set. But I just think he's going to be a little bit too slow on the feet for Henrique. And I think he might even get taken down. His takedown defense has been pretty decent. I mean, he, he did a good job of staying upright. And he always does if you look back in the past. I know he's been put on his back and actually got beat that way before. But that being said, for the most part, you could tell Colombo's takedown defense in his game has definitely evolved to the point where it's just not easy to ragdoll him down to the ground. So it's not going to be an easy fight for Henrique, but I do believe it's a fight he can win. I just think he just has Colombo basically outclassed in most areas. So I'm, I've been impressed. I mean, it's unfortunate for Henrique. A lot of people are going to remember um, his UFC debut against Ngano, um, and he obviously ended up getting finished in that fight. 
in the second round, but now look what Engano has done to everybody else. So to me, it's not even a bad loss. I mean, Henrique is definitely one of these heavyweights that can make an impact with his skill set and kind of work his way up the ladder and, and definitely put himself in a good spot later on. So we'll see. It starts with a, another fight here and getting a win over Colombo first. And I think he's going to do that. Christian Colombo faced uh, Dano in his UFC debut. And honestly, I thought he looked like crap in that fight. Uh, Dano is probably the worst heavyweight in the roster. Uh, just no real good skills and repeatedly, uh, ducks forward and sixes and tries to, to play the game with his hands on the ground. It just makes no sense. And, and Colombo still couldn't beat him. I even got a point deducted at one point. So I just was not impressed with Colombo at all. I thought that he would push a little bit of a better pace or, um, yeah, just, he had multiple opportunities to, to really punish Dano for the way that he was fighting in that fight and he just didn't do it. So I think what happens here is Luis Enrique, who definitely is bigger than we gave him credit for. I thought that he was the type of guy that was just a blown up light heavyweight, but Enrique definitely has uh, packed on a little bit of bulk and he walks around at the, the upper limit of the, the heavyweight division now. And, and he can bully Colombo, I believe. Um, you know, Colombo is, he fights a little bit long and he, he will have a reach advantage here, but Henrique doesn't care about reach. Like he's not a great striker. He wants to just get inside on you and get you down. Uh, Henrique faced a, a similar fighter in, uh, Dmitry Smolyakov, who, uh, similarly to, Colombo was very big, very long, and Henrique just got inside on him, took him down, second round, pulled off a submission. So I think that's what happens here. As long as Colombo does not knock Henrique out in the first round, then Henrique should be able to drag Colombo down as he starts to slow down and submit him, or maybe ground and pound TKO. I think uh, this fight will revolve around uh, Henrique being a little bit better conditioning, Enrique being able to have a, a better ground game overall and Colombo having to travel from Denmark to Brazil while Enrique is fighting in his backyard. So I think uh, this is Enrique's fight to lose and I expect him to not just win, but probably win convincingly. Now dropping down to the Bantamweight division, we have Johnny Eduardo, who is 27 and 10, taking on Manny Gamburian, who is 18 and 10 with one no contest. Now, Nick. What's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Up in Eduardo, minus 185, the comeback on Gamberian at plus 145. Right now it's Eduardo, minus 160, Gamberian is plus 140. So another spot where the line margins have kind of tied up a little bit, two-way actually coming in on this fight as well. Tough one because, I mean, you've got a 36-year-old facing a 35-year-old. Now, as far as UFC experience goes, obviously Gamberian has been in for a lot longer as far as fights go. I mean, he's kind of... I think in most people's minds on the decline of his career, Eduardo hasn't had the UFC fights that Gamberian has, so he's a little bit fresher in that aspect. But overall, he's had more fights than Gamberian. So you got basically two guys that are definitely on the – towards the end of their careers, let's put it that way. Um, Eduardo has looked pretty decent recently at times as well. I mean I, I understand that unfortunately for him, he, he just ran into a buzzsaw there against uh, – Aljamain Sterling that didn't work out to him um, for him that well. But outside of that, I mean, he did pick up a huge win over before that over uh, Eddie Wineland, which I think is a pretty solid win. Um, and now he's looking to kind of get back on track after that Sterling loss against Manny Gamberian, which would be another quality win for him as well. But Eduardo, what you get out of him is, I mean, he's a striking base fighter. He's well-rounded. He's more than just a striker, of course, but that is his game. I mean, he's going to have a little bit of reach over Gamberian here in this spot. He is going to be the more technical striker. As far as pure power goes, though, I mean, Gamberian does pack a punch. Let's not forget that. I mean, the guy is more than capable of, of knocking people out. Um, and again, with Gamberian's style, he does basically push a high pace, look for takedowns, looks to grind people out a little bit. And Eduardo, even though he does have a decent sub game, I don't think he's going to sub Gamberian. He's not going to catch him on the ground either. So Eduardo's going to have to keep this fight upright. He's going to have to stay off his back. And he's going to have to utilize his reach and his striking ability to be Gamberian without getting caught by a big punch himself. I think it's going to be a tough fight. 
I think both these guys have the opportunity and the ability to win this fight. So I do think it's kind of a dog or pass situation, even though Gamburian, a lot of people are going to believe that obviously, again, he's past his prime, probably on the decline and maybe another fight or two, he's out of there. Um, but if you look at it a little bit closer, I mean, you got to give him credit. His last fight was his last loss was against Dotson. John Dotson is one of the heaviest hitters in the weight class as well. So not a lot of us expected him to walk away through that fight. Um, and before that, he did have a couple solid wins. So Gabriel might not exactly be done yet. So we'll see how this fight plays out. I think both these guys are definitely fighting for their careers and their livelihoods. I mean, their jobs are on the line here. I think a loss here could definitely get somebody cut, especially with the changes that the UFC recently made here. So I don't know. I mean, it's going to be a tough fight. I'm going to lean a little bit more towards Eduardo. If he could keep off his back, I think he is a better striker and he should outpoint Gamburian. Uh, maybe even possibly knock him out. So I'll lean his way, but it's not a confident pick, to be honest with you. And I, as I said, as far as a bet goes, I wouldn't lay the juice on this side. It's probably a dog or pass situation. But to me, I'd just sit back as a fan and just watch this fight and enjoy it. And hopefully it's a good fight. But I'm picking Eduardo to win. Yeah, Manny Gamburian has two shots to win this fight. Uh, number one, obviously, is landing a big haymaker or big bomb on the feet. I think Eduardo potentially could be vulnerable to that. Uh, both these guys are up there in age, so um, any one huge shot from either guy could, you know, rock the other, rock their opponent, or even just put him out cold. And then number two for Gimburian, and this is what he's come to rely on a little bit more in recent fights, is just getting top control. If he can uh, drag Eduardo to the ground and get in top position. He could definitely steal this fight, whether it's via decision or ground and pound TKO, maybe even a submission. We did see Eduardo get controlled on the ground by Aljamain Sterling. But again, that is a different kind of breed of fighter compared to Gamburian. But Gamburian does have the, the wrestling in him. We've seen him pull off, um, fights with his wrestling. I mean, he had, I mean, he was, a dead duck against Cole Miller. And then he used his wrestling and was able to survive. Um, same thing. Cody Gibson was just lighting him up, but Gimburin was able to get a takedown uh, and eventually maybe get, get a choke. Uh, and then you saw uh, the Scott Jorgensen fight. Gimburin was able to use five takedowns to win that fight. So uh, the takedowns have definitely been his friend. And if he can, put Eduardo on his back, then he can win this fight. If not, Eduardo is a very technically sound striker. He is uh great footwork, good power, as you saw in the Eddie Wineland fight, mixes things up well. So, and one good shot from Eduardo definitely will, you know, just get Manny Gamburian's head spinning. So you got to favor Eduardo being uh, the Brazilian in Brazil against uh, an, an older fading a uh, star in Manny Gamburian who is coming off of a pretty nasty first round TKO loss to John Dodson. So um, I'm going to pick Johnny Eduardo. I think at some point he connects with his hands and uh, Gamburian's lights go out. So my pick is Johnny Eduardo. Now moving up to the light heavyweight division, we have Marcos Rogerio de Lima, who is 14, four and one taking on Gadzimurad Antigulov, who is 18 and four. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight and how has the public shifted things so far? I opened the Lima minus 140 and it's a Gulof and plus 100 even money. And right now it's the Lima minus 150 and to Gulof is it coming in at plus 130. So a little bit more love coming into Lima's way. I'm not as confident out there. I mean, I understand again, as far as physical size goes, the Lima is going to be the much bigger, stronger fighter. I mean, Anto Gulov actually could be, I think, a middleweight. He has fought a middleweight in the past, and I think that's actually the better division for him to be in. But, of course, the UFC comes knocking at light heavyweight, which Anto Gulov has some experience at light heavyweight as well. You can't exactly turn it down. And this matchup for him is actually a pretty winnable fight as well. So I, I wouldn't exactly count him out of this spot. But Delima is a powerhouse. I mean, we all know. That on the feet, it's where he gets things done. I mean, he's going to have the size advantage, the reach advantage over Antigulov. And if he's able to stuff takedowns and keep this fight upright, he's probably going to knock Antigulov off. Uh, off. So he is a devastating striker that has a ton of power at light heavyweight, and Antigulov needs to be cautious about that. But overall, getting into Antigulov a little bit, he's got that Russian Samuel background. I mean, he's got good wrestling, and he is a very aggressive grappler. Um he does have some okay boxing. He's capable of landing punches and finishing. But again, I don't think he wants to get in a firefight with the Lima. 
And we're also questioning a little bit his gas tank. I think as the fight progresses a little bit, Antigulov seems to slow down. Not that Delima's cardio is amazing or anything like that. So both these fighters are going to be slowing down as the fight progresses a little bit. Um, but his best, best path to victory for Antigulov is definitely getting this fight to the ground and exploiting Delima's ground game. And I think he could possibly do that. So for me, I'm on the fence with this a little bit. I think if Antigulov is able to get the takedowns, he's going to win this fight. And I think that there's a real shot that he does that. But at the same time, how much confidence do I really have? Not a ton right now. So I've been going kind of back and forth on it. I guess I'm going to lean towards Delima a little bit more. I think he he can knock Antigulov off if he stays standing. Um, but again, it's not a spot that I'm going to be comfortable at. And I'm going to look at the weigh-ins for this fight for sure and probably make my final decision at that time because, I've, again, I've been going kind of back and forth on this. So I think it's either going to be Delima by knockout or Antigulov is going to get him down to submit him. So it's kind of a coin flip for me. So this is definitely a dog or pass situation. There's no way, in my opinion, you can bet Delima in this spot. I think you bet Antigulov or you just pass it. So... For me, I'm going to pick Delima, but again, not a confident pick. So that's where I stand right now. But make sure you guys do check the MMA Osbreaker staff picks that we post um, for all of our final picks, including Brian and I. Yeah, this fight, the way I see it boiling down is uh, Antigulov is a very good submission fighter. He has solid overall grappling and... He's on a 12-fight win streak. Almost all of those wins have come by submission, or the majority of them. So Delima's going to have to be careful, especially because he's picked up a couple submission victories in the UFC as well, and maybe he's a little confident that he can grapple with this guy, and I don't think he should. Um, overall, Antigulov is uh, the type of fighter that actually comes in, I think he walks around about 204 pounds or something, so... This is the type of fight that Delima should be able to use his size against. Um, whether it's with his reach, I think he can use some straight punches and jabs. He should be able to outstrike Antigulov on the feet with his size. And maybe in the clinch, just uh, put a lot of pressure on Antigulov. Maybe not go to the ground, but uh, lean on him. Really make him carry your weight a little bit standing and... Uh, just tire him out because if you can uh, wear Antigulov down, um, then it's going to be a lot more difficult for Antigulov to potentially pull off a submission. Now, uh, for Antigulov, I think he needs to just put a lot of pressure on Delima. You saw that in the Nikita Krylov fight. Uh, Rogerio Delima did not like all the pressure Krylov was putting on him, and eventually he made a mistake. Granted, it might have involved uh, a fence pull, a fence grab, and Krylov's part, but Krylov was able to to find an opening and choke him out. So Delima is vulnerable to submissions if he's pressured and if he can make a mistake or if he gives something up, leaves an opening. Uh, I can see Antigulov uh, pouncing on that. So uh, Antigulov is potentially a live dog, especially if Delima uh, doesn't have the best fight IQ here. But overall, I think Delima does have a lot of power on the feet. He should be able to outstrike Antigulov in the stand-up portion, and the fact that he is so much bigger than Antigulov should come into play, even if it does go to the ground. Uh, maybe Antigulov has a little bit of trouble dealing with somebody that's as big and strong as Delima. So overall, I think uh, Antigulov should be fighting in the middleweight division, and my guess is uh, Delima basically forces his hand and, and forces him down to the middleweight division with his performance here. So my pick is going to be Marcos Rogerio de Lima. Now, dropping down to the middleweight division for the final fight of the Fox Sports 1 prelims, we have Cesar Mutanch Ferreira, who is 11 and 5, taking on Jack Hermanson, who is 14 and 2. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I open Hermanson minus 170. The comeback on Ferreira was at plus 130. Right now it's Hermanson minus 210. The comeback on Ferreira plus 175. So no love for that chin of Ferreira. That's basically what's going on here. Uh, there's no question about it. I mean, Hermanson definitely impressive in his UFC debut. I mean, he's another guy that was fighting the Cage Warriors organization overseas and has faced some decent competition coming in. So for the diehards out there, they knew all about Hermanson and he's been a pretty solid fighter. Of course, he actually has some Bellator experience as well. But that being said, he fought good in his debut, and that was good enough, I think, for a lot of people to kind of 
respect what they saw in Hermanson, even if they didn't know of him before, and then kind of give him the edge over Ferreira in this fight. I mean, Ferreira is a talented guy. I mean, let's not forget what he has. I mean, on the feet, he definitely has striking offensively. They could do some damage. I mean, he's long for the weight class, has a lot of power. His ground game, I think, is where it's at and what's going to probably do him – the best in this fight. He's going to need to get some takedowns and get this fight to the ground and avoid Hermanson catching that chin of his. So I think he's got a, a pretty good ground game. He's got underrated wrestling to go along with it. So he's a pretty complete fighter. It's just that chin of Ferreira is so bad. You cannot trust it at all. I mean, outside of that, the guy would be a threat at light heavyweight at middleweight, regardless of the division he's at. I mean, Ferreira has a skill set to be really good. It's just that chin's going to let him down wherever he's at either. So I don't know. I mean, it, it, there's not confidence for me in Ferreira at all even though I think he has a path to victory here, and that is by getting some takedowns against Hermanson. Hermanson's takedown defense is actually decent, but I think Ferreira's wrestling is going to definitely challenge that um, for this fight. So it's going to be interesting. If Ferreira can utilize a smart game plan, get the fight to the ground, he probably comes away with the win. If not, he probably gets knocked out here against Hermanson. So I do think, obviously, the fight is going to play out on the feet um, at least a few times uh, throughout the fight. And if that's the case, I think Hermanson can uh, land that punch and knock him out. So I am going to pick Hermanson to win this fight. I think there is definitely more upside. He's a little bit younger, too. And if he can keep that takedown defense in check, man, he's going to have another highlight type of real knockout on his resume here against Ferreira. So I do like Hermanson. I understand why people are, are kind of fading Ferreira at this point. Just be careful out there, though, especially where it is now. Hermanson around 210, there's no value in that. So if you guys are throwing him to parlays, I would just stay away. Ferreira's wrestling is going to be the key here. If he gets it done, I mean, if he's able to, to, again, utilize that aspect of the game, he's going to probably beat and pull off the upset over Hermanson. If not, he probably gets knocked out. It's as simple as that. So I'm going to pick Hermanson to win this fight. And I can completely understand anybody wanting to side with Jack Hermanson here. Uh, Hermanson looked amazing in his UFC debut against Scott Askham. And if he can just keep this fight upright and go back to work with the exact same game plan then Ferreira is going to be in huge trouble. Uh, I've brought this up time and time again, but Ferreira is one of the worst chins in the entire UFC roster. But guess what? He's learning from that. Uh, you've seen it in his last two fights where he is not trying to ex- leave himself exposed on the feet. He is uh, working very hard to get fights to the floor, drag them to the ground, and then he's not able to get knocked out when his opponent's on their back. Uh, you saw it in the Bing Bose fight where, yes, Bing Bose landed a huge shot on Ferreira and almost put him out in the first round, but then Ferreira used his wrestling and was able to win the next two rounds and win a decision. Um, and then his last fight, Ferreira just absolutely dominated Anthony Smith. I think he got six takedowns over the course of three rounds, stayed in top position almost the entire fight, and then won a very one-sided dominant decision. So... If Ferreira is able to utilize that wrestling this time around, um, obviously Hermanson has not really been tested in the wrestling department yet in his UFC run. Uh, Scott Askin kind of tried to take him down a little bit in the clinch, but that is a completely different style of takedowns and wrestling compared to what Ferreira brings. So if Ferreira is able to utilize that wrestling, I think Hermanson could be in big trouble. I think there is the possibility here for an upset. So... Uh, Even though Ferreira has an awful chin, he is finally fighting with a good fight IQ by playing uh, to his strengths and away from his weaknesses. And if he can keep doing that and keep protecting the chin by getting takedowns and getting in top position in fights and wearing down his opponents and potentially getting uh, submission and TKO victories on the ground, then he could continue to have a, a, a long and healthy UFC career. And... I think Jack Hermanson could be vulnerable to those takedowns being a, a European fighter. So I'm actually going to side with the Cesar Ferreira uh, in his backyard of Brazil uh, getting the win here. Although if he does not get the takedown, he is going to be a dead duck. But my pick here is going to be Cesar Ferreira. Now, kicking off the Fox Sports 1 main card, we have a welterweight contest between Sergio Moraes, who is 10-3-1, and and Zach Otto, who is 14-3. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Happened Moraes, minus 185, the comeback on Otto at plus 145. Right now, looking over at five dimes, it is Moraes, minus 165, the comeback 
He is at plus 145 for auto. So again, line margins have tightened up a little bit. That 185 is now just 165, 20 cent less. And two actually coming in this fight as well. This is a tough one. This is a coin flip type of fight for me as well. I mean, Marais, I mean, look at the skill. There's no question about it. Marais is by far the better fighter because he's got the better technique, and a lot of that is to do with the ground. He's got a better experience overall as well. And his striking for a grappling-based fighter, for a legit world champion level grappling base fighter. His striking game is not bad. It's improving. And he's got a little bit of length overall, usually on most opponents. So Marais is not really an easy out in, in all aspects. I mean, if you look, look how much, um, hype and, and recognition and respect that Magny has gotten recently on his run. Well, before that, he actually got beat by Marais. I mean, that's how good this guy is. So he's picked off some really good welterweights and Marais has a skill set to actually match up well with pretty much anybody. But the problem here is if Marais cannot get this fight to the ground, I think Otto's stand up game will probably come into play and he'll at least outpoint Marais. And Marais, there's always a question mark with his chin a little bit too. I mean, it's probably unfair to say that, but he has been rocked in the past, only been knocked out once officially in um, his career. But outside of that, he does seem to have some problems defensively from time to time and he does get wobbled. So Otto has enough punching power that he could probably test that out a little bit and, and maybe get rid of Marais. If not, he could at least probably outpoint Marais on the feet as well and maybe push a higher pace. So this is all going to come down to what Otto is able to do here. You know what Marais is going to do. He's going to try to come in here and get the fight to the ground. But if he's not able to, he'll, he'll be okay and content with striking with Otto, but I think he's going to lose that battle. So for Otto, he does have a decent wrestling background. He should be able to sprawl and brawl and probably keep the fight up. Uh, I know that, I mean, his win over Josh Berkman in his last fight, and his UFC debut that he took on short notice, by the way, was pretty impressive because Berkman is a tough out. I know he, again, Berkman is not really in the prime of his career right now. I understand that, but still, he's not exactly an easy out. So Otto to come in on short notice in a kind of a tough matchup against Berkman and getting the win like he did, you got to give him credit, got to give him respect here. So Otto in his second fight, more time to train, preparing for stylistically a matchup that seems to be okay because his takedown defense should probably, um, withstand race's takedown ability and if so like i said he probably has a slight edge on the feet as well so is it going to be race subbing auto or is it going to be auto maybe possibly knocking race out or out pointing him on the feet another head scratcher but i'm going to lean a little bit more towards the underdog here i think i'm going to go auto's way uh, i just think that right now again he's kind of more on the rise race not that he's on the way out the door by any means, but at the same time, I think there's still more upside for Otto. And I think if he game plans properly, and it, it seems like he's a pretty smart fighter IQ wise, he should be able to probably win this fight. So tough one, but I'll go Otto's way. Watching Marais' last fight, I mean, Lou and Chagas, I mean, that ended up being a split majority draw or a split draw. It just was not a very impressive performance on Marais' side. Uh, before that, yes, he's had a couple nice bouts. Um, most impressively was three years ago when he faced Neil Magny and just tied him into a pretzel and got that beautiful first round submission. But since then, it hasn't been quite as impressive. I mean, the Mikhail LeBeau fight, uh, LeBeau honestly outstruck him in my opinion, but then Marais finally got some takedowns late. Uh, the Omari Akhmedov fight, Akhmedov was outstriking him. And even got a takedown on him, but Marais pulled off a knockout in the third round. So, um, he's really been playing with fire here in his last three fights, just really has not been that impressive. Uh, Otto, on the other hand, I thought he looked great in his UFC debut against Josh Berkman on short notice. And, uh, he outstruck Berkman. He didn't really have to worry about the takedown, but, uh, for the most part, he just had a, a high pace, good accuracy, had solid overall striking defense, and won a decision. And if he can use his wrestling in reverse, then he could be in a really good position in this fight. Um, Otto, historically, is more of a ground fighter, likes to take fights to the floor, likes to get top position, whether it's ground and pound or, or submissions, that's usually his game. But that is not what he wants to do against Moraes. I mean, Marais is one of the best ground fighters in the entire welterweight division. It's just he doesn't have great takedowns. His knees are really bad. He doesn't have that explosion to get fights to the floor. So if Otto can keep his distance and force this into a stand-up fight, then it's a very winnable fight for him. That being said, there are some scary things about Otto. Um, number one, uh, the fact that he got knocked out by Zach Migglewright about two and a half years ago, who is basically a lightweight. And then 
The other one that is really scary was his fight from July of 2015, so just less than a year and a half ago, against Jacob Volkman, who basically is a lightweight, and Volkman was able to take him down and submitted him out cold with a Bravo choke in the first round. So if Otto is on his back against Moraes, I think he could be in some huge, huge trouble. So this fight is entirely going to boil down to whether or not Otto can keep this fight standing and win it. Uh, and if he does keep it standing, he should be in great shape. If he doesn't, I think he loses. So I'm going to slightly side with Otto keeping it standing more based on Moraes' poor performance over his last three fights overall. But uh, just be careful out there because if Otto does give up a takedown, if he winds up on his back, I'm not sure he, he gets back up. So I'm going to side with the Zach Otto, but cautiously. Now, sticking with the welterweight division, we have Warley Alves, who is 11-1, and one, taking on Kamaro Usman, who is 8-1. and one. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I have an Usman minus 245, the comeback on Alves at plus 175. And right now looking over at five dimes, it's Usman minus 210. The comeback on Alves is still plus 175. So again, another spot where line margins have tightened up a little bit. And there is two-way action coming into this fight. Alves, man, how, how times have changed a little bit with him. I mean, uh, from coming in, you know, winning the ultimate fighter, a lot of people thought that he'd be a next serious title contender at 170 with his improvement. I mean, he's still young, 25 years old. And then he goes out there and loses to Barbarina after he's had some sketchy performances. The Joe Ban fight, a lot of people believe Joe Ban should have won that fight as well. Um, and then he had two sick uh, chokes along the way, guillotine chokes, um, which you can understand. I mean, that's his bread and butter right there for Alves. But he got back on track with those as well and then loses to Barbarina. So what I'm trying to say here is the guy is not what we all thought. I mean, he does have some skill set. He does have some power on the feet. He's, he's got some technical skill there. Um, his wrestling overall is not bad either, but he can be put on his back. But he is dangerous, definitely dangerous and capable of finishing anybody at 170. Once he gets that choke, once he gets that arm around your neck, you're pretty much done. I mean, that's how technical and, and how smooth his uh, transition to that guillotine choke is. So Usman, Usman has to definitely be cautious there. I mean, another wrestler, again, Kobe, Kobe Covington, found that out firsthand. Shooting in on Alves, it could be a, a, the wrong move. So Usman's going to have to very cautiously approach this fight. And if he does, I think he's going to be okay. I mean, as long as he's getting the takedowns. I mean, that's Usman's game, too. That He wants to get the fight to the ground. He wants to smother people. He wants to grind people out. He wants to try to finish you, especially even on the ground. Now, his stand-up game's not bad. I mean, I think a lot of people are kind of underestimating him even on the feet. He does have a little bit of power. And so if this fight plays out standing, I think it'll be back and forth a little bit. And as it progresses, though, Usman will have the advantage because Alves just seems to fade in every fight. I mean, to the point where it's kind of scary if you're betting the guy. So if he doesn't get rid of a fighter early on, I mean, you can bank on round two, round three, Alves being a completely different fighter because he slows down that much. And that is not a good scenario for him against Usman. Usman, just imagine him on top of Alves in round two, late round two, or in middle round three or something like that, Usman is going to be dropping some bombs, looking for the finish on the ground as well, and Alves is going to be huffing and puffing. So I believe that Usman is the right side here. Outside of him getting caught again in that nasty choke that Alves has, which is a possibility because, again, he can finish most people if he gets around your neck, I think Usman wins his fight on the scorecards. But I, not just that, I think Usman probably finishes this fight because I do think Alves is going to tire to the point where Usman's just going to beast him in round two and round three So if it gets that far. So my Pick is going to be Usman, and honestly, inside the distance is what I think is going to happen here in this fight. If it doesn't land inside the distance, then I think Usman wins on the scorecards as well. So basically, Alves, backers, you got one shot, in my opinion, and that shot is getting that guillotine or you're going to lose a fight. So that's the way it kind of plays out in my head. Yeah, honestly, this fight goes one of two ways. Either Usman is able to ride out Top control with takedowns over the course of three rounds while potentially getting a late finish. Or Usman leaves his neck exposed, diving in for a takedown and gets submitted. Uh, we've seen uh, both, honestly. Uh, Usman has been able to utilize that amazing wrestling and top control throughout his UFC run so far. He has been absolutely dominant so far since uh, winning that season of the Ultimate Fighter of... American top team versus the Black Zillions. And Alves has performed admirably since winning uh Tough Brazil, I believe, season two. But 
problem with Alves, as Nick mentioned, conditioning has been a huge factor, and you saw that in his last fight against Barbarina, where he you know, was in complete control in the first round, gassed out. Barbarina outworked him over the final two rounds and won a decision. And then uh, Alves also has just a downright disgusting guillotine choke. And you saw that when he faced a similar fighter compared to Usman in Colby Covington. Covington just charged forward, tried to get a takedown, left his neck exposed. Alves latched onto a guillotine choke, pulled guard, locked him up, and Covington had no escape. So if Usman does not protect his neck, uh, Alves is going to take it home and make a trophy out of it. So that is the one thing to really keep uh, aware of. And obviously Alves is the better overall striker of the two just because he has a lot more technique, a lot more experience in the stand-up. But I don't expect Usman to screw around in the stand-up for very long. And I don't think Usman will give... Alves very many openings to land something significant and affect the fight really either way in the stand-up portion. This is all going to come down to the wrestling game and how Alves defends it and if Alves can submit him. And I just don't think that happens, so I'm going to side with Kamaru Usman. Now moving up to the middleweight division, we have Talis Letis, who is 26-6, and six, taking on Christoph Schottko, who is 18-1. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? Up in latest, minus 160, the comeback on Jocko at plus 120. Right now, it's actually latest, minus 170, the comeback on Jocko is plus 150. So more action coming in on latest, and large margins again have tightened up for this fight as well. This is tough. I mean, Latest has been the one out there, of course, for a long time. I think he's been one of the most consistent, best middleweights that we've seen, I mean, throughout his entire career. I mean, he's just such a difficult out for most fighters because of his skill set. Again, I mean, obviously his grappling highlights it all. I mean, he's an outstanding grappler, has decent wrestling, takedown ability, but once on the ground, he's so smooth with his transition, his sub ability. It's, it's amazing. So that's how he can win fights. And that's his biggest advantage over most people on the feet though. He's developing into a decent little striker. I mean, he definitely packs a punch. He's got a little bit of power to go along with it. We've seen a little bit more success with it as of late. And then even in that fight against Bisping, which obviously now Bisping is wearing that middleweight strap. I mean, he was close to beating Bisping in that spot. I mean, arguably flip a coin who won that fight. I mean, so he, and that was a five round war. So Lightus is proven, he's tested, he's been in there with the best, and he's done really well against most. I mean, he's only lost a top tier competition throughout his whole career. So it's going to be tough for Jocko to come in here and upset a guy like Lightus, but I think he could probably do it. I mean, talk about improvement and overall game and how they match up a little bit. I mean, both these guys are going to be about the same height, about the same reach overall, um, and both these guys are going to have a little bit of different skill set. Jocko is not going to want to go to the floor, obviously. Lightus is going to want to go to the floor. And on the feet, Jocko, I think, is going to be a little bit busier than Lightus. And I think he's going to be land a little bit more accurately as well. Because So striking is going to be the key for Jocko here. Of course, he's got to be at an all-time high right now in his confidence because he, he's coming off a big win over uh, McCrory. He, he knocked him out. A lot of people are surprised how quickly that ended up uh, coming into play there but Jocko give him credit I mean he's starting to finish fights which we like to see I mean if for the most part he was winning close hard fought battles but I think now again his game is evolving to the point where he knows he belongs with the best in the middleweight division I think stylistically this is a decent matchup if he could keep off his back I think he could have some success against Lightus in this fight as well and if he gets a win over an established veteran like Lightus that's a huge step up for him as far as getting where he wants to be towards the middleweight title shot. So Jocko, again, relatively young. He's only 27 years old. Lightus is going to eventually hit that decline spot where he starts looking worse and worse. I mean, what is there more to prove for Lightus at this point? Is he going to get another title shot? I don't think he ever does, honestly, obviously, because the the division is kind of so stacked in the mess that it's up there right now towards the top with who's going to get the next shot anyway. So Lightus is not going to really get another run towards that title where Jocko possibly could one day. I mean, he's still in the position where he could keep on winning some fights and make himself relevant and eventually get in the mix. So this is a huge fight for Jocko. If he gets the W here, his career really, I think, takes off to another level. And I think he could probably do it. So this is another fight that I'm kind of going back and forth on, though, a little bit, because obviously, again, Lightus is the more proven fighter. Jocko still has some honestly proving to do to me. I mean, he still has to show me that he can compete with the highest level guys, and Lightus is going to be one of those tests. But I think the way they match up, if Jocko can keep off off the fence and not really stay inactive too long, if he's, he keeps his foot on the gas, stays off the fence, stays off the floor, he could probably win this fight. So I'm going to pick him to win. Again, it's a tough fight, close fight. 
But I think I have to lean a little bit more towards Jocko's way right now. Yeah, this fight could be competitive. It could be a blowout. Uh, Shotko is on a tremendous run in the UFC middleweight division. I mean, ever since he had that loss to, to Sedenblad, he has just been on fire. He looked incredible in his last fight where he picked up that impressive knockout of, uh, Tamden McCrory. And honestly, uh, Shotko is just flying high right now. Uh, just on a, a really, really impressive overall run. And, you know, Talis Latis obviously, uh, had a great run to get back into relevancy in the middleweight division when he returned to the UFC. But in more recent fights, he kind of came back down to earth a little bit. The, the Michael Bisping fight was really close. Five rounder could have gone either way. Um, but the Musasi fight was really telling for me. I mean, Musasi just completely smoked him. Uh, Litas just had no real answer in that fight and just basically just got outstruck over the course of three rounds and completely dominated. He did look a lot better in his last fight. He went back to his roots. He got takedowns against Chris Camozzi and that is exactly what he needs to do here because honestly, I think Christoph Jotko is the better overall striker. Letus does have some power and he could wing some shots. And I, I expect a stand up fight between Jotko and Letus would be competitive, but I think Jotko would get, uh, the better of him over the course of three rounds. That being said, if Letus can get the ground game going, if he can close the distance, if he can put Jotko on his back, then that is going to open up a whole new world of opportunity for him because uh, Jotko's one loss so far in the UFC was when he left his neck exposed during a clinch situation with Magnus Sinblad, and Sinblad just dove on a guillotine choke and choked him out. So if Letus is able to get this fight to the floor, then he should have a serious advantage. It's just all about whether or not Jotko leaves him an opening to do that. If Jotko is able to utilize the distance and reach and his straight punches, then I think Linus will have a lot more difficult time getting on him compared to how he performed in his fight against Chris Camozzi. So uh, I do think that Jotko has uh, a really good opportunity to pick up the biggest win of his career, but it's just all going to boil down to whether or not he can keep Linus off of him. If he can, then Jotko probably wins by either decision or TKO, if he can't, I can see Letus winning a decision with takedowns or a late submission. So I'm going to very slightly lean Kristoff Jotko, but you do have to be very careful, especially if those takedowns are coming easier than expected. But my pick here is going to be Jotko. Now, moving on to the women's strawweight division, we have Claudia Gadelia, who is 13 and 2, taking on Courtney Casey, who is 6 and 3. Now, Nick. What's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? I've been at Godella minus 475 to come back on Casey at plus 325. Right now it's Godella minus 450, come back on Casey plus 360. Another spot where line margins have tightened up to action coming in this fight as well. Line seems to be at a good spot right now where it's kind of tough to bet either way, obviously. I mean, Godella, in my opinion, is the much better fighter here. I mean, she's going to be smaller as far as height goes. Casey's going to tower over her. She's going to have a reach advantage over her as well. But outside of that, Godella is by far the better fighter. I think she's the better fighter on the feet. I think she's by far the better fighter on the ground. All aspects of the game. I mean, Casey does have some issues with cardio as well as it, the fight progresses. Typically she slows down and she's, you know, that's honestly what's cost her some fights along the way in her career thus far. She's a talented individual for sure. She definitely has some skill on the feet. She's aggressive. She comes out firing a little bit on the ground. Obviously she's proven. I mean, just look at uh, the, the submission. She just got over Random Marcos. So Random Marcos is uh, an outstanding fighter in her own right. So with that size and with that submission skill early on, she was able to jump on something fairly quickly and, and finish the fight over a fighter like Marcos. So right now, Casey, her confidence level is at an all-time high. It just It's going to come to an end in this fight though. I mean, Gadella again, uh, she was on her way of, of becoming champion at 115 pounds. I mean, she almost beat Joanna and, and, you know, I think she was winning that fight and then her cardio issues. I was just talking about Casey slowing down. Godella's cardio cost her the fight. I mean, if she had it in the gas tank, she probably would have ended up uh, 
picking up a W there and, and becoming champion. So that what is what hinders her. But this is not a five round fight. This is a three round fight. And Gadella definitely can win two out of three rounds here, probably all three rounds against Casey. So I'm not really worried about cardio here. In fact, like I said, Casey's probably going to fade a little bit faster anyway than Gadella. So this is just a nightmare matchup for Casey. I think if she wins this fight, she's going to have to jump on Gadella, like she, uh, kind of like she did Randa Marcus early on, probably get the job done in round one and pull off either a submission win or a devastating knockout. But outside of that, she loses this fight. Gadella probably finishes her as the fight progresses as well. So Gadella wins the cards. She probably has a good shot of winning inside in this fight as well. It's just going to be tough to beat Gadella. Outside of Joanna and Jacek, I mean, I think Gadella is definitely the number two girl in the division, and I think she's going to continue uh, to be that way for a long time. So my pick is Gadella to win. Yeah, I just don't see how Courtney Casey can win this fight. Uh, Casey is big and strong and powerful, but her biggest weakness and Gedalia's biggest weakness historically has been the, the conditioning and, and she's facing and Gedalia's facing somebody whose conditioning is worse than hers. Gedalia is extremely powerful and strong. Gedalia is the better stand up fighter and Casey almost all of her wins have come on the ground and that's Gedalia's bread and butter. Gedalia is the better wrestler of the two, a better submission artist, has better ground and pound of the two of them. I just don't see any way that Courtney Casey can get in there and make something happen because usually she gets her wins because she can manhandle some people. And, and I don't see her manhandling Claudia Gadelia at any point in this fight, um, not even in the first minute when she's at her strongest. So I just think this is a horrific matchup. Uh, especially with Gedelia most recently moving to Jackson's MMA, where she's just going to round out her weaknesses and become an even better overall fighter. So I just think Claudia Gedelia steamrolls. She probably gets a finish in the second or third round when Casey starts to really fade. And yeah, I'm just straight up picking Claudia Gedelia here. Now moving on to the co-main event of the evening, we have a bantamweight contest between Thomas Almeida, who is 21 and 1, and Albert Morales, who is 6 and 0 with one no contest. Now, Nick, where did you open this fight, and how has the public shifted things so far? I'll put Almeida minus 265, the comeback of Morales at plus 185. Right now, it is Almeida minus 320, the comeback of Morales is plus 260. So, not really that surprised people coming in on Almeida. I mean, outside of his last. Unfortunate loss for him. I mean, against Garbrandt, what a performance by Garbrandt in that spot. Almeida has looked like with the absolute beast at 135 pounds. I mean, what a striker he is offensively, especially. I mean, he's, he's just so hard to deal with. Accurate punching. I mean, it, the ability to mix combos together. He's just a finisher, man. His knees, everything about him is just dangerous on the feet offensively. But there is a big but. It wasn't just Garbrandt that landed on him. And, and was able to do some damage. I mean, if you look back through his fights, for most of his fights that he's been in, those firefights that he's been in, especially what stands out to me the most, I mean, I guess Brad Pickett, he was almost beaten that fight against Pickett. And Pickett was able to land early on and did some serious damage before he ended up coming back and winning that fight. So you got to give him credit for having the toughness to survive and then bounce back. So I, I realize that. But the problem is he's that hittable. I mean, he's he's shown it time and time again that anybody that has a little bit of knockout power can get through that defense of Omeda and, and put him out. So maybe not out cold, but do, do enough damage to rock him at least and, and just definitely change the whole complexion of a fight. And Garbrandt just was able to, to get him out of there with the kind of knockout power he has. So there's a lot of question marks for me with Omeda. I mean, if his defense was a little bit tighter, if I didn't see him get wobbled as often as he does, then I would definitely be on his bandwagon thinking, okay, man, this guy is definitely going to be wearing the title one day around his waist. But I'm not so sure about that. Defensive flaws are probably going to come back to haunt him. And you know what? The UFC is not exactly doing him any favors here against Morales. I realize a lot of people out there might not have been too thrilled with um, Morales' UFC debut. He did take that fight on short notice against Perez because it was kind of a back-and-forth fight. I thought Morales did enough to win that fight, even with the point – the deduction or whatever, it was ended up being still a, a majority draw. So it was a pretty competitive fight. Got to give Perez a lot of credit there as well. But for what the situation was, I think I thought Morales did pretty well. But in that fight, he showed some defensive flaws as well. I mean, he, he's definitely got tagged a few times in that fight as well. And then his cardio, he did slow down as that fight progressed. So there are some flaws and some holes to Morales' game as well. I mean, and a lot of people believe that Almeida is going to expose it. That's why they're betting him up and he's now over 300. But Morales, as far as style goes, 
he is an aggressive fighter that has a ton of punching power, and he also has good wrestling to go along with it in a submission game. So he is a finisher. He's capable of getting the fight to the ground when he wants it. He's capable of keeping the fight upright when he wants it with his takedown defense, and then he's capable of, of landing bombs and knocking people out as well. So Morales is not an easy out, like I said. He's a well-rounded fighter. He's going to be a very dangerous fight for Omeda. Omeda is going to have – actually, I'm looking at the reach now. He's going to be two inches shorter, and, and um, the reach is probably going to be about the same same depending on where you look at. Some sites have uh, Morales having a two-inch reach advantage. Other places have it exactly about even. So he's not going to be small compared to Almeida. He's going to be big, strong. Again, he has a full camp under his belt. He knows the situation here. Morales is a very intelligent fighter. He's a very motivated fighter as well. He knows that Almeida is – kind of at the top tier of the bantamweight division. And if he picks off a major right there, he puts himself in prime position for the future. So this is going to be a war. It's going to go back and forth and somebody's going to probably get put out. So it's, it's who makes that mistake first that ends up getting put out in my opinion. So is the line at 300 justified? I don't think it is. I think that the line should be a lot tighter in this because Morales has a realistic shot of winning this fight. Um, but I'll go with, I guess, right now, what the proven commodity is, and Almeida is a little bit more proven because, again, he's been able to weather the storm, come back, and win some of that stuff. So I, I don't know. I'm leaning slightly towards Almeida. But as far as the bet goes, again, here, it is definitely a dog or pass situation. There's no way I would lay this. Um, I would definitely consider throwing something on Morales at the current price because I think he's just getting too much disrespect at the moment right now for that. So official pick, I guess I have to slightly lean towards Almeida until he shows me that he can t- tighten up that defense and not get wobbled and rocked as much. I can't just have complete faith in him. I know a lot of you guys believe in him out there, and the guy is definitely talented, but I'm just not sold on him quite yet. So for me, Morales could be a live dog, but as far as pure pick goes, I mean, three to one favorite, you got to side with him a little bit. So I'm slightly going Almeida's way. Yeah, and you have to side with Almeida here. I mean, the kid won 21 fights in a row. He has incredible offensive striking skills. He has power. He has the technique. His just issue is defense. Um, his striking defense has never been very good. He's way too willing to brawl and trade bombs on the inside. And his chin is not the best. You saw that in the Garbrandt fight, obviously, where he got clipped. He never really recovered. And then Garbrandt just put him out. Um, now, against Morales, this, this is going to be a high-action fight. I mean, Morales is a kid with... Just no fear whatsoever. I mean, he went into that fight against uh, Alejandro Perez, and he was just winging bombs. He is aggressive. He is trying to take your head off with every strike. And if he connects with anything against Almeida, then this fight could get turned on its head in in a moment's notice. But that being said, Morales' technique is not that great. So if Almeida is uh, smart, if his defense is improving, if he's really been working on... Uh, shoring up some of his faults, especially after that first loss. That probably was a big wake-up call for him. Even though he'd been rocked before in wins, maybe he wasn't taking it as serious. But if he is working on his defense and uh, maybe his head movement, then this should be a much easier type of fight for Almeida, just because he has that offensive ability. He just needs to not get cracked as much as he does defensively. So... Uh, Morales is definitely dangerous and he has power and he is n- going to be willing to throw down. But overall, I just have to side with Thomas Almeida here. His uh, overall offensive output, his power, his technique. At some point, I think he uh, breaks through and either wins a decision or a TKO victory as Morales starts to fade. So my pick is going to be Thomas Almeida. Now, moving on to the main event of the evening, we have a rematch in the light heavyweight division between Ryan Bader, who is 22 and 5, and Antonio Rogerio Negero, Little Nog, who is 22 and 7. Now, Nick, what's the MMA odds maker's perspective on this one? Up in Bader, minus 350, the comeback on O'Gara at plus 250. Right now, it's minus 365 for Bader. The comeback on O'Gara is plus 305. And it looks like it was just moved to 365 is around minus 350 earlier. So line basically staying about the same. I mean, this is a rematch from their fight a few years back, which Bader won and uh, deservingly so. And that was a big test at that time for Bader. And it still is. I mean, O'Gara, I think a lot of people are, are a little bit misled. They think that, I mean, he's, I mean, obviously he's been in the sport for a long time and he's got some wear and tear with all the wars that he's been through throughout his career, but he's not quite as worn out or as, as, 
you know, uh, at the hit that decline spot, I should say, as his brother um, has been. So I think he's a little bit fresh. He's got a little bit more left in the tank here. But again, I mean, how much more can he keep going? It all depends. I mean, if that chin survives and lasts for a little while longer, I mean, the guy has a skill set. Nogueira has outstanding underrated boxing. Of course, on the ground, there's not many to compete can compete with him or hang with him on the ground. He's got a big advantage usually on the ground as well. So he is a very tough out and he's even been performing relatively well as of late. I mean, if, if you look back outside of his devastating loss um, to Johnson, uh, to Anthony Johnson, which of course most people get knocked out in a devastating fashion and, and when they're fighting that guy, but I mean, he had a very competitive fight with Shogun. And then of course he bounces back and knocks out another guy that was kind of climbing the ladder a little bit, Patrick Cummings. So, He's not exactly done is what I'm trying to get out here. So Bader has to be careful, even though he, he's beat him before in the past. And there's not much upside for Bader in this spot here because, I mean, if anything, it's kind of a, a win-lose situation. I mean, if he wins, all right, people are going to say, yeah, he beat Nogueira again. So what? If he loses, it's going to kind of look bad for him. I mean, a lot of people are definitely going to drop his stock. So this is a must-win fight, I think, for Bader at this point. And if Nogueira gets a W here, I think obviously he's right back in the mix. People are going to respect him a little bit more as well. So this is a big fight for both guys. But I, I still think that Bader should be able to keep this fight up right where he wants it. And he is uh, definitely the more dangerous of the two strikers, especially right now. I mean, Bader did look really good in his last fight again. I was glad to see him kind of rebound because, again, talk about devastating losses to Anthony Johnson. Bader had one as well. So these guys kind of have similar fights recently. That uh, you know, I mean, kind of haven't gone their way, but they've both bounced back in an impressive fashion. And Bader's was against Latifi, of course. So this is a fight again, winnable fight for Bader. I think if he fights smart, he should be able to outpoint O'Gara on the feet. Even though it will be competitive, it'll be close. I think Bader can win it out standing up, and then of course um, he can win on the cards as well. So I think Bader can win by knockout here. He can win on the scorecards as well. Now the one thing about Bader that is always going to be concerned is that chin. I mean, he has been tagged, he has been knocked out before in the past as well. So you can't 100 percent trust his chin but for the most part if he's careful here and he fights smart i think Nogueira is probably not going to get him out of there so my pick is going to be bader at the price again i don't think there's any value though i think you just kind of stay away and watch the fight and see how it plays out it's unfortunate but that's just the case here so i'm going to pick ryan bader to get his second win over Nogueira. yeah Nogueira definitely does still have something left in the tank you saw that in the shogun fight where he almost knocked shogun out and then you saw it in the cummins fight where yeah, Cummins started strong, but all it took was one good shot from Nagara and he put his lights out. So um if Nagara can connect against Ryan Bader, we have seen Ryan Bader's chin has not held up. So uh it all it really takes is one good shot from Nagara and Bader can be in big trouble. But as we've seen, it might only take one good shot from Bader and Nagara could be in trouble. You saw the Anthony Johnson fight. Uh Anthony jo- Anthony Johnson just went right in Nagara's grill, threw a bunch of haymakers and bombs, and, and Nagara was put out immediately. So Ryan Bader has the power to do that too. So if uh, Bader presses the action, he might be able to put Nagara's lights out. Um, Bader showcased uh, a couple extra wrinkles in his last fight against uh, Latifi, where he was looking good on the feet. He was landing good straight punches, some jabs, and then when Latifi... Uh, duck down for either a takedown or just to avoid something else, Bader kneed him right in the face and absolutely knocked him the hell out. So Ryan Bader definitely has the ability to win this fight. He has been improving his stand-up dramatically over the last couple years where he was able to win uh, a stand-up fight against Rashad Evans. He was able to win uh, against Phil Davis, who's now the Bellator champ. Um, and then obviously the Latifi fight, he looked great. I mean, the only time he hasn't looked great was when he came into that fight a little scared against Anthony Johnson and, and who wouldn't be, to be honest. So I'll give him a pass on that one. Um, Ryan Bader's wrestling has also you know, been very good. And if he wants, I think he can take Nagara down and Nagara's takedown defense is pretty good, but you got to remember, um, he's the same age. He's a uh, as his twin brother, who is now retired after taking a beating throughout his career. He's 40 years old. So, I mean, how good are Nagara's reflexes going to be if Bader shoots in for a takedown and, and tries to put him on his back? I think Bader should still be able to uh, take Nagara down and keep him down if he need be. This is a five-round fight, so that is something you have to consider. So both guys are probably going to be pacing themselves, but... Uh, I do see Ryan Bader just overall having uh, the better offensive skill set with 
his stand-up that is improving, his jab that is actually getting pretty good, and the fact that he can mix in his wrestling. Now, Nagira does have a good ground game, an underrated ground game. He has a very solid half guard, but that didn't stop Ryan Bader from winning a decision the last time they fought. And I think if Bader can mix things up, make Nagira have to respect the wrestling and the striking, it's going to become a bit of a guessing game for Nagira, and I just don't think he passes that guessing game unless he connects with a, a big power shot. And obviously that can change everything in an instant, but for the most part, I still think this is Ryan Bader's fight to lose, so I'm going to pick him. So that'll do it for our full event breakdown for UFC Fight Night 100. Our premium bets for the event will be released this Friday following the weigh-in, so stay tuned for that if you're an MMA Oddsbreaker Premium member. If we have a free play to give out, make sure to follow at MMAOB Premium on Twitter because that's where we'll post them first. We can also notify you of our free bets via email alert if you prefer that method. Just send an email to picks at MMAOddsbreaker.com and we'll add you to our free bet mailing list. Special thanks for our sponsor, Five Dimes Sportsbook. Good luck, everyone, and hopefully the betting gods are on your side this weekend.